So without any youthful ambition of becoming either a professional pilot or a photographer, I decided 10 years ago to become both and discovered that sharing landscape stories from above was a passion I never knew I had, but it was a career I had trained for since I was 16. I first came west from the largely irrelevant landscape of my suburban youth, simply to become the cowboy of my childhood fantasies. But instead of inventing a new story of myself, I was invited into a much more interesting and complex story of families and communities that were woven into this incredible landscape. As a serial dropout, I bounced between Western ranches and Eastern colleges for nearly a decade, finally graduating from Vassar College in New York with a thesis project on the recreational land boom that was transforming the rural West. And of course, I'm referring to the old new boom of the 60s and 70s, long before we knew what a real boom looked like. After a couple more years on the ranch, I was seduced by the economy of the next new boom into the growing business of trout stream restoration. A couple years later, with impeccable timing, the blockbuster fly fishing film A River Runs Through It came out. And with a terrible, wonderful synergy, the demand for river restoration consultants skyrocketed. Seduced by the idea of fixing nature with science, I left Montana for a graduate degree in river engineering. Now, without a math class since junior high, I really struggled with the complex math of watershed process in an unfamiliar landscape of chalkboards and PowerPoint slides. But, but joining the university uh, flight club, the view from a rented airplane translated the stories that were hidden in those abstract numbers. Because as an outdoorsman, a farmer, and now a completely enchanted pilot, I recognize that we don't understand the landscape as a manifestation of orderly data. Our understanding of it comes from a blend of specific and vague inputs from stories that are told and experienced, that are intuitive and, and that are chaotic. We may not be able to summarize or even understand the complex math that describe a functional ecosystem, but we can definitely recognize fragmentation, especially when we see it on the scale that the aerial view permits. In my consulting business, I used aerial photography as an analog for data to describe watershed process, but I, but I found that the imagery had a much stronger power to the extent that we identify with a specific landscape. The aerial photograph, half map and half art, becomes sort of a story of ourselves. My clients would get lost in the data, sort of tracing and reliving stories through the tip of their fingers. Stories of teepee rings and homestead cabins, tractor wrecks, game trails, where they camp with the grandkids, where they were when they heard their first wolf. Now, despite the narrative value of my imagery, the engineering involved in river projects kept me tied to a quantitative view of the landscape. And the aerial photo maps available at that time, flat and completely artless, gave only the crudest hint of natural processes. So I started designing my own mapping systems. Because while we were working on a watershed scale, we were making decisions at a particle scale. So I really wanted to be able to see the subtlest patterns of water and energy and earth. When I made a map, I wanted it to represent a moment in time. I wanted it to tell a story as much as be a two-dimensional piece of the planet. Now, while I was tinkering with relatively healthy, tiny pieces of fragments of the landscape on the ground, I was amazed by the transformations I was watching from the air, and I committed myself to telling those stories with aerial photographs. One of my first assignments was to create a series of visual illustrations explaining complex subdivision and land use data for planning departments and land use groups, 
And in this illustration, I digitally reimagined the development of a random western valley. And from a single large ranch, one can imagine selling off that higher and drier ground by the foothills and maybe opening up a gravel pit to build the roads. And maybe the kids need to go to college, so we'll sell off the homestead pasture. And now we're in our 60s and we're tired of hard work and cows. So let's just raise hay on 250 acres and spend the winter with the kids and the grandkids. And so on until the county is struggling to provide services to hundreds of homes. And maybe as a community, we're recognizing that five acre parcels are not simply miniature versions of wide open spaces. In several public meetings, I was confronted by property rights advocates for these manipulations. You can't just come in here with your fancy pants computers, they told me, and mislead the public with your nightmare scenarios. And that's where I had to point out that this is an actual photograph of the Teton Valley near Driggs, Idaho. And this is the fake imagery that I concocted with my fancy pants computers. <laughs> and in that awkward moment, strong imagery highlighted a conflict be between people's abstract beliefs and their intuitively sensed, their intuitively felt values. The infinite complexity of the landscape cannot possibly be summarized in a single graph, chart, or illustration. We need to be able to abstract and symbolize, quantify and summarize the data in order to adapt. And those graphs told a powerful story about the floods that ripped through the Musselshell watershed in the spring of 2011. And these photographs tell a different part of the same story, replacing the precision about what the river did with a narrative context about what the river did to farms and habitat and families and communities. I put these images on a public we website, and I was amazed to see them go viral, albeit in a rural, subdued, Montana kind of way. <laughs> but, but they instantly went throughout and beyond the watershed into the homes of people whose story it was and into the offices of people who's, who were tasked with managing the landscape in the context of those stories. We need to listen to what the data tells us about how we transform the landscape into commodities, but we also need to be mindful of what's underneath and at the edges of this data. And imagery shows us what these processes look like. Imagery reminds us of the habitat and the communities that are on top of the landscape, uh, on top of the commodities, uh, future commodities. Imagery hints at the magic we find in the places we cherish. And it describes simply what we couldn't possibly convey in just a few words. And strong imagery provides us with an organizing principle around which we can understand, store, and recall important data, like the grim statistics at different intersections on the landscape. You know, Aristotle, in his treatise on memory, pointed out that without image, thought is not possible. And I think of the simple, abstract precision with which something so elemental as a circle can be described. And yet, in a moment, a portrait of Yellowstone's Grand Prismatic Spring leaves you with a, an image of such unlimited complexity, an image that will stay with you much longer than any symbols I could use to describe it, whether those symbols address science or beauty. As I float above this amazing landscape, I am guided by the data, but I am motivated by this view. Thank you very much.